mouth. I don't know about you, but The Lord is high above the heavens, and the glory above the nations. And the glory above the nations. The Lord is high above the heavens, and the glory above the nations. And the glory above the nations. Give God the highest praise, acknowledging Him always, and all the people say, Halle, 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 the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And you clap your hands right here. And the glory above the nation. And the glory above the nation. I said the Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And the glory above the nation. And the glory above the nation. Hallelujah! 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 H
Put your hands together. Give the Lord a praise. Hey. Lord is high above the heavens and his glory above the nations. The Lord is high above the heavens and his glory above the nations. The Lord is high above the heavens and his glory above the nations. The Lord is high above the heavens and his glory above the nations. Give God the Give the Lord a praise. Come on, is he worthy of praise, worthy of glory, worthy of honor? Hallelujah. How many of you really know that the Lord is worthy? The Lord is, come on. Yep, that's, that's it's not for me. The Lord is worthy. It's not, I promise you, not clapping for me. Amen. Hallelujah. I've considered all the things that God has done, not only in my life, but in the life of the people that are around me. And as I said earlier this morning in exhortation, that I have no other choice but to know that God is good. Uh, one of my favorite songs by Jonathan McReynolds says, may your troubles keep you near the cross. May your struggles know that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. And may your bad days prove that God is good. God is indeed good. I don't know, sometimes I've been through some stuff and I look around and I'm like, you know, I never expected it to happen that way. But God found a way to make the thing that looked really bleak and the thing that looked really bad and the thing that looked not so well. And he decided to, make some beauty out of it he said he makes things beautiful in his sight even when it doesn't look the way that we want it to look god makes it look beautiful so i'm going to sing this song you've been so good to me and i want you to come on and sing with us it's very uh consabile, which means that you can sing it along alongside us it's just very very simple very easy song gets this I ask you to repeat with me, say, it goes like this. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Even if I try, cause you've been so good you've been so good you've been so good to me oh say lord you are good you've been so good you've been so good lord you are good you are good You've been better than I can't praise I can't praise you enough. I owe you my life. I owe you my life. I can't praise you enough. I can't praise you enough. Even if I try. Even if I try, cause you've been. You've been so good. So good. You've been. All over the world to sing with us. Oh, Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Been so good. Oh, Lord, you are good. You've been better than I can praise you and I can praise you enough. I owe you my life. I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Can't praise you enough. Even if I try. Even if I try. Yeah. Yeah. Sing it along with us. Say, oh, Lord, you are 
are good. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. Oh. the Lord a praise. Come on, give the Lord a praise because he's good. Somebody give the Lord a praise because he's good. His mercy endureth forever. His truth endureth to all generations. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. Anybody know he's good? Anybody know he's good? Oh, come on, let us stand as we receive our pastor that will take us further into our worship service. Amen. Hallelujah. God has been so good. So good. Has God been good to you, Magda? Sister Vanessa, has God been good to you? Sister Barton, has God been good to you? Sister Veronica, amen. Sister Astrid, has God been good to you? Amen. God has been good to me, and I know that God has been good to you watching. Thank you for being with us today. God is good, and we are going to celebrate that today. Thank you, music ministry. 
for your wonderful ministry. God bless you. Reminding us that God is indeed good. Please have your seats. God bless you in the house of the Lord. Every once in a while, it's time to restart or reevaluate what we're doing in different facets of our life. And every six months, we have a, a specialist come in and help us to reevaluate some things. And you know, I, I this time I, I'm just going to be very, very candid, very frank, because when I say it nicely, it doesn't get through, Sister Magda. Sometimes you have to be blunt. So I'm going to be blunt today, and hopefully that will open up some things and, and we can get better, including myself, including myself. The truth of the matter is that we are eating things that are killing us. We are eating things that are killing us. And we think that they are good, and they are packaged like they're good. We have been trained to think that way. But they are indeed killing us. Slowly, it takes years, but it is killing us. So, we need to find out what those things are, and not only killing us, making us weak and sick. And then you go to the doctor and they don't tell you what you're doing wrong because they really want you to keep coming back. As Chris Rock said, the money's not in the healing, it's in the treatment. Amen. Can I, I'm just being blunt. Is that, is that, can I be blunt? So, I'm not a specialist, but I know one. <laughs> and we are so blessed to have Sister Samantha come with us, come to us again, and teach us. But not only teach us, but teach us how to turn things around for the better. Kind of just like sin, you know? Once you know what it is, you can turn it around and go for the better. So we're going to learn how to live longer and be healthier and be happier and stronger. Right now, we're going to introduce Sister Samantha Bailey. We're going to ask her some questions, and you are going to be able to ask some questions too toward the end. Right now, we're going to get right to it with Sister Samantha Bailey. Let's give her a hand as she comes. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm, I love being here. I love it. Thank yeah. you for asking. We, 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 love, we love having you. Thank you. You have helped us in such a wonderful way, <laughs> personally. And Lady Mary, you have helped us, and a lot of people in the congregation, you've helped us too. So we continue uh, to ask for your help. Absolutely. All right. Let's get right into it. So. <laughs> What are the things that we are doing, things that we are eating, yeah. that are literally killing us? Taking our lives, taking our livelihood, taking our how we can thrive. Um, I was thinking that sometimes it's very, in order to really understand, to boil it down to something um, simple. And when we can get it down to like one thing, maybe we can understand the big thing better. And there's something called atherosclerosis. You say, might, that, say that again, please. Athero. Athero. Sclerosis. Sclerosis. Atherosclerosis. You also might hear arterial sclerosis, but that just means uh, the hardening of the arteries. Hardening of the arteries. Okay. And there's a lot of things that stem from hardening of the arteries. So, arteries are everywhere, from our toes to our eyes to our brains. So, a lot of us understand plaque buildup, but I don't know if we really know what that is. Right. And the plaque is basically fat. So it's an overabundance of fat that's now getting stuck into the arteries, and that's creating what the doctors called atherosclerosis. But this hardening of the arteries is a precursor to so many things right. that if maybe we understand how to not even have plaque buildup, there's a lot of things we don't even have to deal with later on in life. Right. right? 
Um, I know sometimes when I've come here, I talk a lot about heart disease and cancer, like the big, big, big things. There's other things that people really suffer from and the families really suffer from um, that I want to give a little bit of focus to. And one of them is Alzheimer's. Mm, yeah. Alzheimer's has a gene, they've, they've found it, but out of the susceptibility of Alzheimer's gene, out of Alzheimer's patients, only 50% have the gene. Mm. So who are these other 50% of Alzheimer's sufferers? Um, they noticed hardening of the arteries mm. in the brain. So the same thing that would lead to like heart attacks or heart disease is the same thing wow. that can lead to, our, uh, to Alzheimer's. Wow. And not just Alzheimer's, but even dementia. Gonna... Even dementia, it's the same thing. So, you know, and, and, and that's one thing that we can do, okay? That's one thing that we can really, really, really do that's dietary related, and I'll get to that part too. But there's an environmental factor with Alzheimer's and dementia as well that most of us would never guess, and we have no idea what we're doing. It, no, we're not taught in schools, and part of it is um, a chemical that used to be legal in the United States to put on crops, called DDT. Yeah. DDT in the 60s was finally banned. It was because it was so dangerous to our lives and the lives of other living things. But it doesn't matter, it's still pervasive in our world. It's still in our food system, even though it's illegal. Not because anyone's spraying it, but because it doesn't go away. So it's still there in the soil, it's still there getting eaten up by other livestock and animals. So 90% of people in America have levels of DDT in their system. From what was done? From what was done decades ago. Wow. From what was banned decades ago. So, and DDT has a byproduct when it's metabolized in the body called DDE. It's not important, but understand that when it comes to Alzheimer's, they find that Alzheimer's patients have elevated levels of DDT and DDE in their system. Um, and with people who have dementia, it's four times higher than normal. Four times higher than normal. So then one way to try to combat this is like, well, where are we getting this DDT from, right? right? Most of it is going to be unavoidable. It, it's in our system, it's in our planet, it's in our world. It's not gonna be fully avoidable, but some things have more of it than others. Um, and so, it's poultry the most, poultry the most, uh, beef, fish, pork, but poultry the most. So if we, let's say we see Alzheimer's is in our family, and here's another thing. Like I said about the susceptibility gene, only 50% of Alzheimer's patients actually have the gene, 50% don't. Right. Even with twins, there's a higher chance that only one twin is gonna have Alzheimer's and not the other which also is a way to give us hope. That means part of it is your, what you choose. Part of it is what you do. If we're talking about twins that have the same exact DNA, right. and only one is getting Alzheimer's and one doesn't, and that's the majority of twins. The wow. majority of one person who has Alzheimer's who has a twin, the other twin is probably not gonna have Alzheimer's. Wow. But that should also tell us, okay, we can do something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I don't know if you have anything to interject. Um, well, well, in the moment. well I, it, it made me think, how does someone with dementia, is it possible to, to reverse it, your way out of, it. out of it? So this seems to be very hard and arduous, but apparently there have been people that can really lessen some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, what has been found in, uh, let's say, like. Uh, I don't think it was nursing homes, but something where older folks were, were kind of living, um, but with these issues. There was one study that just took away the processed meat from their cafeteria, whatever they get fed. So when I say processed meat, what I mean is hot dogs, sausages, things like that. Some cold cuts, but not all meats. They weren't vegetarian. They were still eating like other meat stuff, but not the highly processed things. Here's the other thing about DDT. DDT worsens its effect when cooked. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So 
<laughs> so processed meat is highly, highly cooked because it's already cooked one time before you buy it and then cooked at home. I would assume that's the reason why. I would assume. Because you can't eat raw chicken. You can't eat raw chicken. But, but, but a company that's going to make like, fr like chicken nuggets, they already cooked it once. And then you get it frozen and then you cook it again. And okay. so I think maybe that's part of the reason why um, the processed foods, if you remove them, things get a little bit better because it's like doubly cooked. I don't know. So in this home, they removed all the hot dogs and sausages and bacon and things of that nature. And the, like a good amount of the Alzheimer's patients were just getting better. They were just getting better at recognizing people, remembering random things. Um, and this wasn't, they weren't trying to reverse it. They were just trying to take processed food out of their, the home. And, and that started happening. And so it makes me feel like if we did, what if we did full tilt boogie, like all of it, not just remove the processed foods, but maybe remove some other meats or maybe lessen it a lot more, or maybe increase fruits and vegetables. Because one of the things that can reverse atherosclerosis is antioxidants. And antioxidants are huge in like berries and greens and salads and things like that. So these are, you know, if we want to talk about what's killing us, these are the things that can save us too. Antioxidants, okay, you said berries, salads, greens, greens. all kinds, okay. All okay. Greens. greens. Anti yeah. That's an antioxidant. Antioxidant. What is exactly is an antioxidant? Okay, that's a good thing. Um, so there's something called oxidative stress. There's a lot of things that we do that create it. Some things are good. Like you can get oxidative stress from exercising. Exercising is so good, it's all right. And our bodies are adept at dealing with oxidative stress. But our body's not adept at also eating foods that, uh, there's something called free radicals that damage cell walls and damage veins and arteries. So this comes from processed foods, sodas, processed sugar, deep fried foods, all these things are like giving us these free radicals, which also leads to oxidative stress. An antioxidant is like the op opposite of an oxidative stress. So antioxidants kind of neutralize it. So let's say in a perfect world, um, I don't know, 2000 years ago in Greece, right? You're in the sun, fresh olives from this tree, tomatoes, and you're doing the Olympics, like they do, did in Greece, but they made up in Greece, and there's a stress that comes with it. It doesn't matter because they're eating olives and blood oranges and tomatoes and real goat that was not, you know, real animals that were not messed with, not eating bad foods. Um, and so it doesn't matter how much exercise you're doing, that oxidative stress is nothing, that means nothing. But it does mean something if we also are breathing in polluted air if we're drinking in polluted water, if we're very stressed, we're working a lot. I mean, these, these creates oxidative stress too. Like stress does this, lack of sleep does this. Like this is our whole lifestyle. So if that's the case, what we should do is eat the foods highest in antioxidants. If we can eat those foods in abundance, we're doing the best we can to neutralize all the oxidative stress that modern living has put onto us. Berries are just the highest. It's not just berries, it's like all fruits and vegetables, some grains, some, some beans, they have it too, but fruits are the highest, berries the highest of the fruits. Out of the vegetables, the greens are the highest, the leafy greens, the dark ones, the kale, the collards, escarole, lamb's quarter, mustard greens, all of those. Those are all the highest. And the more raw form, the higher, um, content you actually absorb that's really hard yeah <laughs> well when i it, it not all of it with that just that last part i'm trying to i'm trying to think of how i could cook greens <laughs> raw or not cook them <laughs> but but you know this is the thing we don't have to do all the things but we need to do most of the things right, right? so you know, there's foods, I'll give you another example. Let's talk about um, another more minor issue that a lot of women face. It's called polycystic ovarian syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of it, or PCOS. A lot of people deal with this, a lot of women deal with this. 
And in general, what it is, is a hormone imbalance due to a bunch of many, many little cysts, many little growths on the ovaries. And it starts messing with the hormones. It leads to hair loss in women, hair growth on the face and chest and stomach. Uh, it leads to infertility. Mm. Um, it'll be, it's harder and harder to have, uh, to get pregnant when you have PCOS. The doctors still act like it's something random, but it's not. Um, and when you go deeper into polycystic ovarian syndrome, there are certain markers they find that these people have that other people don't. And one of them is called glycotoxins. Glycotoxins come from a cooking method um, of certain materials. Baking sodas, uh, not baking soda, just baking <laughs> and then sodas. Um, and meats cooked a certain way. So, I'll give you an example. Grilling, frying, broiling. Those are the methods that create an abundance of glycotoxins. Grilling? Grilling, broiling, and frying, and I'll tell you why. These are high temperatures. Oh, okay. The heat, if anyone remembers anything in chemistry class, if you can remember, I don't even remember all of it, but sometimes you can play with fire. And if you mix fire into something, it will change um, the structure and you can't bring it back, right? Because the fire changes it. Maybe you burn it all the way. Once something's all the way burned, it's done. You can't bring it back. You burn like, I don't know, a piece of plastic. It's not gonna come back like this, right? It's the same thing in anything, including food. You're gonna use fire or really, really high heat. You're going to change the molecular structures of those foods. Not the biggest deal, except when we're rushing around, what do we do? We get fast food. Fast food has fried chicken sandwiches. They have fried French fries. We're talking about deep fried and deep fried. Right. And then deep fried meat and deep fried potatoes, which means something else. So here's the thing. If you take a piece of chicken and you deep fry it, eat, but then you also take that same piece of chicken and you boil it, right? So you, maybe you curry it or stew it and throw it in a pot or you make it into soup. That's half the amount of glycotoxins. You already reduced that amount by half and you still get to eat chicken, right? But even so, french fries that are deep fried, so we're using higher heat than the boiled chicken, still have less glycotoxins than that boiled chicken. So it really does behoove us to reduce our meat consumption if these are our concerns. So I'm saying this talking about glycotoxins, and the reason I'm talking about glycotoxins is because there are significantly higher levels of glycotoxins in sufferers of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Maybe their bodies have a hard time releasing them, or maybe they eat a lot of that. That is up for debate and discussion. It could be a genetic factor. Maybe their bodies don't release it as much. Luckily, there are some foods that take glycotoxins out of our bodies. Brown rice is one, and mushrooms are another. So let's say someone is suffering from polycystic ovarian syndrome, and you're on all the drugs, because they put you on tons of drugs for that, steroids and, and everything. And you're like, okay, I just want to, I really want this to reverse. So you, I would do a combination of the two. Avoid anything deep fried, you know? I would also say avoid meat too, but at least avoid deep fried meats, right? Avoid anything deep fried. Avoid anything that's using like 400 degree temperatures. And then increase brown rice, increase tons of mushrooms, and there's a bunch of other little things in the middle that you can do, but those are two very big things that are already, um, published in studies that work, that people can do. Along with all the other things that we talk about, antioxidants, berries, vegetables, and all that stuff. You mentioned um, cystic uh, and, and uh, fibroids. Yes. And I wish I had a woman to ask this question. I feel a little bit uncomfortable um, asking it being a man, but um, I've seen a lot in our community. Yes, uh, the majority. Yeah. The majority of black women. It, it, thank you. Yes. You said it. Yes. Uh, why is that? Um, so this is, this has something to do with how um, genetically, there's, there's genetic differences based on ethnicity okay. that are not recognized within our medical community. The reason it's not recognized is because decades, decades ago, 
the American Medical Association decided that if you ch looked at the bodies as if we're all different, that is racist, and we can't do racist things. The problem is we are different. Right. And so when you don't recognize it, then you do disservice to other bodies, especially a lot of the norms were based on white bodies. So let's say the average iron intake, the average vitamin C intake, the average blah, 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 all those things, when they were creating this in the late 1800s, they weren't using black people. They weren't using the Asian immigrants either. They were using the white population and they were normalizing it from what average they were finding and then they said, okay, this is normal for everybody. And what, now that there's more communication, there's an African Medical Association on the continent, it's like, oh no, it's, it's different. We're actually different. And we've been doing a disservice, acting like we're all the same. So, one of the reasons why it's so high in black women is because we have more estrogen receptors in our cells and all over our bodies. Lots of things have high estrogen or something called xenoestrogens. Xeno just means it's synthetic, it's not real. Examples of xenoestrogens are pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, lotions, perfumes, makeup, nail polish, um, cleaning supplies, um, dishwashing liquid, laundry, standard laundry detergents. All of these things are a bit toxic. Toxic things have a xenoestrogen effect. There's nothing toxic that has more of a testosterone effect that doesn't exist. So the only thing we're doing in our world when we're creating things that are natural are putting more estrogen in the environment. So what that means for women, who, or, who women in general, all women, is now we're inundated with more estrogen than our natural bodies already do. So we're talking about earlier puberty. We're talking about um, you know, even, even bodies that look different at 12 years old now than they did 50 years ago, right? Yeah. Right? This is all part of it. Wow. And especially for black girls and women because we have more estrogen receptors. So all women are getting the effect of it and then black women are getting it even more. So what does estrogen do in the body? It grows things, it grows tumors, it can grow the excess of it. Tumors and cancers and cysts and fibroids. So you wanna couple all of that together, this is why there's so many fibroid sufferers within the black community. So you're talking about a, a, a lifestyle change. It's not just talking about food. I mean, you, you mentioned makeup and lotion. Yes. 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 Because it's everything. In order to stabilize lotions, you have to put something toxic in it so it doesn't go bad. It doesn't start to smell. Anyone who's ever made their own lotions, I don't know if anyone's into it, um, but if you happen to have ever done it for yourself, make your own soaps or even have a friend that does it, if you get it, you see it goes bad. It actually goes bad. In order for like, you know, Eucerin and Lubriderm to exist, they have to put something to stabilize it. Like they're not trying to harm anybody, right. but they won't have a product if they don't. Right. Um, similar to makeup, but there are makeups that specifically decide to not use so much of those toxins. Like what? One of them was called like Bare Naked was one of them. I don't really know it so well. I'm not a good. How, does, how is it advertised? The, the, the healthy makeup is. They're, they, these are usually small companies that you'd never see in commercial for. Small, okay. tiny, niche. They don't make a lot of money. It's hard to find them on a shelf anywhere. Okay. Okay. Those types of makeup companies. Okay. But. I'm coming back to you brothers. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But this is part of the reason why it affects so many black women, um, including just cancers of the reproductive organs for black women, uterine cancer, um, ovarian uh, cancer, uh, and things of that nature. So it's the estrogen in our environment and our excess es estrogen receptors. Thank you. One thing that um, I also noticed um, in, in all communities, when I was coming up, you didn't hear you know, all this, everything was, ADHD, ADHD, he has ADHD in it, like, and, um, you know, of course, I'm no, no kind of expert, but I'm tired of hearing it, because uh -huh. I don't think it's that all the time, because uh -huh. I see smart kids. Um, anyway, is there something that we're this eating that is causing certain, certain behaviors in our children so that are misdiagnosed? I, I will say, 
this is complex. There's a lot of factors. Okay. And there's so many things that are not definitive. Okay. When I say that, meaning published, that you can read, tangible, there's stories, you know, there's correlations, there's people who are putting things together, but nothing where they did a long-term study. And I think like ADHD hasn't been a diagnosable thing long enough for, ha for us to have a real long-term study that's published right now. I think that's part of the reason. But here are some things. Early on ADD, so we're talking about like the 90s ADD, 90s, early 2000s, okay? Then what started becoming clear was food dyes and food additives were disrupting the behavior of children. So we're talking about, let's say, Doritos. Doritos, that orange is not a real orange. It's a, it's a dye, something fake. Um, so it's that food coloring. That would affect them. And kids tend to, foods with that tend to be geared towards children. Right. Skittles, M&Ms, all that stuff. Dyes in cupcakes, frosting. A lot of the frostings are dyed if it's not chocolate, right? So if you get a red frosting, it's dyed. Right. Um, and this also includes artificial flavors. So it's, and that's the same thing. In order for a cherry Skittle to taste like cherries, they're not using cherries. They're using uh, a chemical flavoring to make it mimic a cherry type of flavor, right? And this is huge in kids' diets. So enough of that, you're going to start seeing some disruption in behavior because it acts like a neurotoxin. So that's like toxicity to the nervous system, which affects the brain and it affects the behavior. Now, when we talk about it now, it's much more complex. It's not just our food. It is the distractions of our internet life. So we're talking about active screen use. I'm, I'm talking to adults too. I'm not talking about kids. Right, right. I'm talking to adults. I'm talking to myself because it's in me too. Um, social media, the like scrolling, 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 scrolling. What it does, it gives us these dopamine hits every time something's new, every time something's flashing. So if we go back like in 1985, like I had a, we had a phone on the wall. I remember when we got an answering machine, right? So if someone wanted to reach you, they might miss you and they might just have to wait. Now, if someone texts you, the, the anticipation is you're gonna get a text right back. Even that, even I'm like, not even talking about like looking at social media, even just a life of like this concept always having to do something, all of these give little dopamine hits. What happens when we're always having dopamine hits, like a drug addict. What, what exactly is a dopamine Ooh. hit? Dopamine Sorry. is a hormone that's like a motivation hormone. It tells, it's something that was built in from eons ago to tell us keep doing that. Like when we ate something that tasted wonderful and sweet, like, like an orange or berries, and it's like, ooh, this is great, keep doing that, it will help you. Right? It's a motivation thing. And it, the same thing will come from even completing a task. Completing a task gives a, a rush of dopamine. Actually, the journey of completing a task gives you dopamine. And that's another thing to, to tell that you keep doing it. Yes, you will prevail if you keep doing it. The problem is we also get it from scrolling and texting and likes coming in. We're getting these dopamine hits. Now it's all the time, all day. So what that does to our brain, our brain starts getting numb to it. So if we take somebody, wow. so we take, let's say candy. It could be as serious as drugs, but let's talk about candy instead, but it's one and the same. Someone gets a, a hit of a, of a strong candy early enough, and they want to do it again, because that's an amazing amount of sugar. Sugar gives do dopamine hits, too. It's an amazing amount of sugar. And now, like, try to imagine kids, how hard it is for them to just chill, <laughs> chill on just, just take three, only three. Yeah. And it, like, they, they can't, their body already is wired to say, no, it's do it, it's good, because our bodies wanted sugar. Sugar is good for us in fruit form. But we don't know in modern form that this, this thing why we can't stop, why we can't stop doing it, nature had put that in in the natural world to help us. But now in this world, it's just harming us because it's too much. That's, uh, that's... I kind of went all over the place with it, and I just, I didn't mean to, but... No, no, that, this, is, this, is so, uh, this is so wonderful because somebody read um, Proverbs 25 and 27. Tw 20, Proverbs 25 and 27, please. If you can read it really loudly, 
Um, if someone has it right now, Proverbs 25 and 27. I have it. I have it right. You have it, Magda? Okay. I, I, have it, I have it right here. Do you have it? Okay, I have it right here. It says, I'm going to read the uh, New, Living Translation, New Living Translation. It is not good to eat too much honey, and it is not good to seek honors for yourself. They're equating too much sugar <laughs> with being addicted to looking for too much glory to yourself. It, the theme is really addiction. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's deep. Yeah. It's really, uh, yeah. 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 So there's something in your brain that tells you, yeah, that's good. Keep doing it. Keep yes. doing it. Keep doing it. Yes. But the thing is, if, when you keep having these hits, and these hits can be anything from candy to social media, liking and scrolling, if you keep having these hits, it's like you need stronger and stronger. And this is how people start getting addicted to all these other distractions. Right. And they have a harder time. All people, adults, I'm not talking about kids anymore, adults right. having a harder time just focusing in school, at their job, um, not doing anything, just being home and not doing anything. That's hard and hard to do. Get, going on a subway and literally just sitting there instead of picking up their phone, and put, like it's almost painful not to. That's ADHD. That's mm. ADHD. So when we're talking about ADHD today, it's moved so much more from the, what is partially, mostly food, I believe, maybe partially genetic also. Also, kids are hyper, and, and the way we do schooling is not really geared towards how kids are, too, so that, that's all that. But now today, with all of the excess of adults being di diagnosed with ADHD in the last 10 years, this is internet, social media, too much screens, it's affecting our brains, we can't focus, we can't concentrate, and now it's making us lose our thoughts, lose our memory. I'm talking about people 30, 35 years old um, because of that. But luckily, it can, it can come back if we just go on screen diets or like not watch it. Yeah, it can. You can normalize it. So we're addicted, our phones are making us addicted or having too much dopamine. Yes. Addicted to the dopamine yes. from our phones. Yes. Wow. And it's, and it's um, making it harder for us to do regular things. How does that affect our relationships? Re pretty bad. So it depends. Everyone's different. Um, sometimes sitting with somebody and just chatting is not enough. Right. I'm going to go back to like the sugar and drug um, uh, correlation, so, like a hard drug, a really hard drug, and you're coming off of it. Right. I mean, we've, we're in New York City. I'm sure we've seen people or know people who have addiction issues and they're coming off of it. And what do they look like when they're fiending, when they want another hit, right? The same thing, a similar thing is happening to, I really think it's more so people 40 and younger. Right. Um, I don't think it's really so much 40 and older, because it's just a different... Right. different generation. Yeah, but the connecting just someone uh, right across from you talking, it's not enough. Exactly. And they, if there's a restlessness, they need more than this. Right. And so maybe they'll also take out their phone while they're talking, and they right. just look a little bit, and they look a little bit, right? Because they still need the hit. Their, their, their body is like aching for it. But like I said, the good thing is when it comes to ADHD in specifically adults, I'm sure some kids too, kids is more dietary. If you tell yourself, you know what, for a whole week, no YouTube, no IG, no Facebook, no Twitter, none of that, I'm gonna read some books, I'm gonna work out, I'm not gonna look at a screen. It will normalize. Yeah. You can do that in one week? Maybe more like three weeks, but I, <laughs> but but literally it, it will normalize. It's not the end of the world. Right, right. It's really not the end of the world for the adults who have ADHD due to our modern technology. It's not. So let's before we go to questions, let's define ADHD. Um, can, can you define it for us? Uh, it's hyperactive. Uh, ADHD. Because nobody wants to admit that they have that. 
Yeah, and I've told, uh, a lot of us have it, and I'm using these quotations marks because modern life has made it real. It's real, ADHD is real, also we don't have to have it, so that's why I did this. Attention De Deficit Disorder is ADD, and ADHD is Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. Hyperactive disorder, and the hyperactive is the whole like I need a stimulant. Okay. I need to, I, I need, I, I, okay. I need something. I'm I'm feeling something. I can't just not do it. So I'll say even just to test yourself, if if you decide to like delete the social media apps for a day, the TikToks, the Instagram just it's not on your phone. Not even Duolingo. Basic. Sometimes even just looking at your phone doesn't enough. But if you at least only use it for text messaging and maybe WhatsApping some friends for one day and see how you feel. If you feel like you're fiending for something more, you have ADHD. Wow. That is built through our modern technology. And if you feel that, then put yourself on a screen diet for a week or two and you can normalize it and then you'll actually not want it as much anyway. Good. You just have to try to keep it regulated. And maybe when you go back to it, put a timer on these apps, like only 30 minutes or one hour on Instagram a day. It's good. And you can fix it. The reason why it's really, really, really important is it does affect other aspects of our life. It affects how we do our jobs. It affects our motivation to do other things. Because right, right now our motivation is this. Right. Like I said, dopamine, dopamine is like a motivation hormone. So if this becomes such a big motivation, then other things are less of a motivation. If this is giving you huge, like the colors, the screen, the brightness, the movement, over and over and over again, how are you going to sit in a lecture class and like pay attention and write notes and absorb and study? How are you gonna do that if your body already is wired to? I want colors and I right. want flashing pictures. Exactly. It's very, very hard. That becomes our standard. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Questions. Can you think of questions that are going to... Yes. You got to really speak up until we can get a mic over to... Well... Oh, there she comes. And this goes for you two audience uh, watching. If you have a question uh, that you want to put in the uh, chat, in the chat uh, on YouTube, uh, please do so and we will get to it. Like I'm a diabetic, right? And all I do is and fried chicken and all, like going out to the restaurant and I need to lose weight. How can I do that? It's deciding that I'm, I'm going to change my life. So first comes the decision. Um, because I think a lot of people... Let's repeat the question. Um, not everybody heard the question. And the, I think the question was, uh, not you, we'll, we'll repeat it. The question was, I'm... I'm uh, you got to change things. So you're diabetic. Yes, you're I'm di you diabetic. eat certain things and like fried chicken, lots of sweets. Yes. You need to lose weight. How do I do this? Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I like Popeyes, all that. Yes. So... Uh -huh. I, when I have clients, so for people who don't know, I do nutrition counseling for people, mostly for people who are very sick, um, because I work with this homeopathic doctor, so we cross referral. And I have learned I have to really first have them understand you have to decide you're, you're, you're going to change your life. I've noticed with people who, let's say, just want to diet, like nothing else, nothing else, I just want to lose weight, I just want to lose weight. What happens, a lot of people just think they're just going to do it temporarily and then they can skate. You can't do that. You do it temporarily and then you skate going back to what you like to do and then it comes back. That's why people say diets don't work. Diets don't work because it's not a diet. You have to change your life. Lifestyle changes work. Diets don't work. So first, it's really understanding you have to change everything. You have to decide this is not good for me. This is poisoning me. This is helpful for me. I need to eat this more often. And then everyone's different. So my suggestions may not work with your lifestyle, but broadly speaking, it's something like, okay, if I usually, if I don't have time to, to cook at all, and all I can do is go to fast foods, well, instead of, of um, going to KFC, I'm gonna go to Chipotle. Because at least at Chipotle, it's rice beans, guacamole, like stuff not fried, you know? That's one thing, right? For people who like, I can't cook, I'm too busy, I need fast food, that's what you do. 
do that enough, you're already going to feel a difference because the food at Chipotle is way different from the food at Wendy's and Popeye's, way different. Or if someone does have time at home to do things, um, but maybe can't do it all the time, I would say invest in a rice cooker, invest in a slow cooker. If you do that, you throw all the stuff in, turn it on, the slow cooker when you go to work, you come back, everything's done and everything's boiled, not fried, because it's in a slow cooker. You throw the rice in, 20 minutes, don't have to sit over a pot. If you gotta like do things with the kids and like help them with their homework and you can't just sit over a pot, just put it in a rice cooker, it'll pop up in 20 minutes, you got your rice, you got whatever you stewed, whether it's like a chicken stew, whether it's like a veggie stew, whatever you put in that slow cooker. If that is in your lifestyle, that's what I would suggest. And then as you make these changes, you start seeing where you can change more things. Another thing I usually tell people, broadly speaking, but everyone's different, is get at least, at least five servings of fresh, fresh, uncooked, fresh fruits and vegetables a day. What that means is sauteing broccoli is great. Do it. That doesn't count though, okay? It's great though, do it, do it. Saute your broccoli, eat it. But when I say fresh, I'm not including sauteed broccoli. I'm including raw broccoli, right? So you need to change things like specifically diabetes, which is actually very, very easy to change. Uh, no, let me take that back. It's a simple formula that involves a real lifestyle change, right? You reduce the fat intake, so really reduce anything fried deep fried because that's a lot of fat reduce certain meats reduce the dairy because dairy is like 75 percent calories of fat like it's a fat issue diabetes is more of a fat issue than a sugar issue the fat is blocking the insulin from putting the sugars in the cells the fat's the issue you start taking that out your blood since your insulin sensitivity goes up which is a good thing you want the insulin sensitivity to go up so that it's working and then the diabetes symptoms start reversing also atherosclerosis like we talked about in the beginning, that also occurs in people who are diabetic and people who have heart disease and they're one in the same thing. It's a build up of too much fatty foods. Reduce the fatty foods, increase the fruits and vegetables. Overall, that's the way to go. But you have to figure out what your lifestyle is and what you can change. Because not everyone can change, not everyone can do the same thing that other people do. And that hardening of the um arteries or the plaque in the arteries yes. is causing the high blood pressure. It's causing the high blood pressure. It's causing uh, the heart attacks. Exactly. It's card causing cardiovascular disease. It's causing in diabetics, you know, when people lose the feeling in their limbs, in their yeah. toes, and their fingers, that's the same thing because the arteries is not getting enough oxygen and blood down there. Um, a lot of diabetics will have issues with their eyes and their kidneys, same thing. The eyes have ocular veins and capillaries and so those are getting clogged those are wow. getting yeah so this is why so just so you understand when you when people talk about diabetes and things that come in time with diabetes and they'll talk about glaucoma yeah. or affects your vision it's it's the capillaries the capillaries are getting blocked up from the same thing that created the diabetes that creates the heart disease that creates the alzheimer's that creates the dementia it's all it's like it's all the same thing <laughs> we get down to that room we like fix all this stuff boils down to the same thing. Another question. Yeah, you spoke about the components of certain things changing once it's exposed to a certain heat. So I don't like vegetable, but I do a lot of smoothie. Does it change when we put it in like a high speed blender? Um, so say the first part again, I missed the first part. No, you, you were saying the components of certain things I guess the nutritional components of certain things. Yes. It will change at a certain temperature. You talked, you spoke about Oh, meat. yes. So I was wondering if it's the same thing. Okay. When we're talking about like vegetables so, and um, fruits. Because I do a lot of smoothies. Yes. Right. Yes. So am I getting the same nutrition from it when I put it in a blender or a Nutribullet? So the question is, I was talking about how certain foods change their chemistry or sometimes can get denatured under certain cooking methods versus not cooking methods. And she does smoothies and wondering if blending it changes it. Overall, mostly it does not at all. The little bit of change is so minor, it doesn't even matter. I'm not even gonna talk about it. Basically not at all. It's one of the things I, I tend to recommend to almost every client. Like I said, most of my clients are very, very sick. 
almost every client because in one smoothie, you're probably already gonna get the five servings of fresh fruits and vegetables anyway that I'm talking about. So if you down that as a breakfast, you don't have to worry about that at least for the rest of the day. So no, that's one of the best things I recommend to anyone. It's something that I've been doing for the last, I don't know, 12 years. Most of my first meals of the day is either a green smoothie that I blend or I eat a bunch of fruit, like standard. And yeah, okay. yeah. That's good, that's good. Sister Neely. Yes, I thought that I was doing a good thing to start boiling more and you mentioned about broiling. So, one of the so let's say in comparison to, in comparison to deep frying and fried, yeah, sure, it's better than that. But we're talking about the, the minutia of all these, these things in our foods and how we work with our foods that we have no idea about. If you broil your food, overall, that's not the biggest problem. Sure, it will increase you know, the DDT levels. It will increase um, certain carcinogens, sure. But if other things in your life are fine, it doesn't matter. The only problem is there's so many things in our modern life that do hit us all the time every day that we have to do, sometimes we have to do more extreme things like chill out on, on meat sometimes or chill out on eating meat that's not boiled or steamed or something like that. And it's only because of our modern life. If our air was cleaner, if our soil was less denatured, all of these things happening, I don't think these conversations would ever even need to happen. I don't think so, but because we're inundated all the time everywhere with something, like I just said, makeup and cleaning supplies too. We're all inundated all over the place, sometimes, to just decide, I just want to feel really good in my body the rest of my days. We do things that are considered more extreme. It's not a big deal to broil your food. It really, really isn't. But it is a big deal if you also eat french fries and go to fast foods and you don't cook your foods and you use denatured oils and you're stressed and you don't exercise and you don't sleep. Like All of this is why we're breaking down. It's, it's a combination. Okay. Good. Another question, Mother Wesley? Yes, uh, I wanted to ask the young lady concerning, I have been trying to uh, do things different. I mean, I just started really to try to do things to kind of yeah. help my bones. But my legs kind of bother me quite a bit. And so I started, I went and I started eating more fruit, nuts, uh, vegetables, and so I read in the, uh, the magazine concerning celery, and it was letting me know that if you don't have enough, enough of sodium in your body, it has a way of drawing from your bones. Okay, so I know what you're saying. Um, one, I would say when it comes to articles, be mindful that articles are written to entice people to buy the magazine. So a lot of the better information would be in studies. But yes, sodium is an essential nutrient we should have. But we have so much sodium in our food that we don't have to worry about it. Trust me. The only people that ever sometimes might have sodium diets are like raw, like raw vegans, like long-term raw, raw vegans. They, they actually have had low sodium. And they try to, they, and because they decide not to eat salt too. Some of these people are salt free, raw vegans. They have sodium issues. If you're not that, you're not going to have a sodium issue. There will be no sodium being pulled from the bones. In fact, in fact, what does get pulled from the bones is when we drink milk. So we drink milk, our bodies have a reaction because it, it metabolizes kind of acidic. And in order to cool it down, to cool, any, to cool any of these more acidic foods down, I'm talking about going to fast food, fried chicken, those things. To cool it down, our bodies always want to be at homeostasis. It always wants to be at the same level. They're like, oh no, too much fried chicken. Let's take some cooling minerals from the bones to cool it off. All the other stuff we're doing is taking the minerals from our bones. The milk, the fried chicken, that stuff is taking the, the stuff from our bones. So don't worry about the sodium. The sodium's not the issue. Hold on, mother, hold on. 
what can I, what can I do to really help my legs? My legs is bothering me quite a bit. The thing is, because I don't know you personally, and I don't know what your history is, I, I don't know what's going on with your legs. You see, if you know if you're working with a doctor, and let's say you're working with like a nutritionist of some sort, and they get to talk. There's things that we can both figure out, like, oh, this is probably this, and this is probably this, this is what we need to do. From here, me and you, it would be irresponsible for me to give you any suggestions about your legs, because I don't know what's going on. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. Uh, all right, thank you. You're welcome. One more question. Hi, um, so I just had a quick question about the DDT thing that you said. Yes. Um, so. When purchasing like meats and stuff like that, where can you go to find stuff that have like lower levels of DDT in it? No, it's, it's not even like an organic or non-organic thing. So when they were dumping lots of DDT into our food sources, this is for about 20 years, or, or probably more than 20 years, but about 20 years, a lot of DDT went into our soil. There's something called half-life, if you remember chemistry, where let's say plutonium, which is nuclear, radiation will give you cancer absolutely, right? But, the, but it has a half-life where it gets less and less and less um, nuclear over time and, and has less and less an effect. And everything has a half-life, but some half-lives are super long, right? And takes forever for it to just get, to be, get less, like half potency. When I say forever, I'm talking about hundreds of years sometimes, depending on which chemical. DDT is just there, it just exists. There's a few other chemicals that just exist because of us playing around as humans. So DDT, when they stopped it, it's already in the soil. When it's in the soil, it's absorbed by a, a, a blueberry bush. It's eaten by, from the grass, a cow's eating the grass, right? Then they have a baby that has DDT in it. You see what I'm saying? It just keeps living, it keeps going on. So the best thing to do when it comes to DDT um, is understand that it's mostly in meat, right? If this is your concern, I would reduce meat, and then, depending on how you cook the meat, the higher temperature, the more aggravating the DDT acts within the body. It's less in fruits and vegetables. It's still in fruits and vegetables, because it's just in our environment, right. but it's far less. Okay. Um, so that's the best thing to do. It's not about being organic, it's not that. It's even, even when it comes to like breastfeeding mothers, there's DDT in the breast milk. But there's less DDT in the breast milk of a mother who's vegetarian. A lot less, like four times less. Okay. Yeah. And, and while, while you mention that, and this is the last question and we're going to, uh, we're out of time, but as far as mothers go, there are some mothers that cannot uh, breastfeed. Yes. And, and we know that the formula, you said last time, yeah. is like 50% sugar. Yes. So what does the mother to do when the baby yeah. needs milk and she can't nurse and the formula is 50% sugar? I will answer this the full way. I usually, I don't always because it's unconventional. So, like, good, better, best, right? The best next substitute if the mother, the actual biological mother cannot produce breast milk is somebody else who has breast milk feeding your child. That's the first one. The second one is, is becoming more common, but there's companies that actually pasteurize human breast milk, oh. and you can buy those. I don't think they're cheap, but they exist. It's becoming more and more common. Uh, when I had children, there was like one I had heard of, and now there's like a few. Okay. Um, and they pasteurize it. So, you know, for any concern about like bacteria and like people you don't know, it's gone. It's just like pasteurizing cow's milk that we drink abundantly, right? It's even better. <sighs> After that, it's mother's choice. Right. Like, okay. there's not. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having Samantha me. Samantha Bailey, let's give her a hand. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Very unorthodox. Very unorthodox. Normally, we normally we'd be having church. You know, be jumping and shouting and uh, trying to give you a, a a sermonic message, but um, I'm tired of seeing our folk die unnecessarily. And, um, and, and our children, things, we, we just want to be healthy. We want to be around long enough to enjoy God's grace and mercy and pass our gifts on.
to someone else and help somebody. And we can only do that if, we, uh, if we're living long enough and feeling better um, when we live. Let us stand. There may be someone here that would like to do better in whatever area, not just eating, whatever area. We can all do better in something. If you can think of some area where you could use some improvement, I know I have several. We're going to pray right now that we take that step with the help of the Lord, with the help of the Holy Spirit to move forward, to do better, eat better, live better, treat people better. What we put in our system, what we filter out of our phones and social media, making our phones an idol, being addicted. We can all do better in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message, Lord. Thank you for this education. Thank you for working through the gifts and the knowledge and the experience and the wisdom of Sister Samantha Bailey and what you are imparting to us through her. Help us to use this knowledge, Lord, to maybe eat more like Jesus did and strengthen our bodies, heal our bodies through what we put in our bodies and help us to do better in other areas, oh God, whatever that area is, whatever that subtle addiction is, that habit, Lord, these habits that are unhealthy, maybe emotional habits, help us, Lord, to break these habits that are not productive and not in your will for us. Help me, oh God, even me. The song says, even me. That's what it was talking about, Lord. Help us to be balanced by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the example of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. Amen. All right. We'll all help one another do better. We have a visitor, my brother. What is your name? Can you, I don't have a, your card, but can you holler out your name? Tyrell? Let's give a hand for Brother Tyrell. God bless you, man. Who else do we have? We have some other visitors. All right. Dwayne and Madeline, your family now, so you're... God bless you. We want to thank you all for those who came out yesterday and helped uh, clean the church, prepared for the convocation. Sister Magda, Dwayne, and Madeline, you are with us. Let's give them a hand. Others. Genesis was out here. All of you all who came, God bless you. Brother Todd, uh, thank you so, so very much. We love you. God bless you. It is offering time, time now. It's offering time. Amen. I didn't get no hand clap on that. <laughs> Give to your best. Give, give, give your best. We are here uh, serving the community, doing all we can to serve this community and other communities. Uh, do your very, very best in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you. Amen.